The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. Wrestling to the Max SmackDown Review. And we are live to tape with the Wrestling to the Max SmackDown live review here on the W2M Network. Good evening, afternoon, whenever you're listening, everybody. I am your host. My name is Terry Brothers. Joining me, as per usual, the absent from the Raw report for W2M Network this week, Brandon Biscabing. Hey, hey, hey. Because he was busy helping me with the Raw reaction over on the Chair Shot Radio Network. Yep. Um... Well wishes sent out to Andrew Belaz as he recovers and to Tony Acero as he has a hangover, most likely. Uh, hopefully both of the boys will be back next week for the show, and then you and you and Cedric can get back to doing Raw here on W2M. Yep. A couple of things that happened <coughs> on Monday Night Raw end up falling out tonight on SmackDown, though, so what do you say we go ahead and get to it? Let's do it. All right, before we do so, uh, let's talk. Uh, what were your thoughts on Money in the Bank in general? If people uh, who maybe listen to the Raw Reaction yeah. pay-per-view might want to get your thoughts here. Yeah, overall it was a good pay-per-view. Obviously the ending wasn't exactly the greatest. But outside of that, it was a solid uh, pay-per-view. Overall, I'll probably give it a 7. and I'll give it a 7. No, you gave it a 7.5 yesterday because Did I, I told give you it I was just like lower okay. than you with a 7. Fair enough. So quit trying to steal my number, you schmuck. I can already tell how the show is going to go today. <sighs> Anywho, uh, I personally gave the show a seven. I thought the women's money in the bank match was creative, if not necessarily completely well executed. Uh, but when you have a lot of ladies that aren't usually in this kind of match, in this kind of match, you're going to have issues. Seth Rollins and AJ Styles is probably your second best match in the WWE's calendar year thus far. Mm-hmm. The only one that I would put above it is Kofi Kingston and Daniel Bryan from WrestleMania. Oh, yeah. Um, the Elimination Chamber match is up there as well, but I think from sheer emotion that Seth and AJ and then Daniel and Kofi specifically take the note there. The, oh, men's yeah. money in the, bank, the men's Money in the Bank match was really, really good. And unlike most, I didn't entirely hate the ending because I think that there are multiple ways that you can go with that. And I think we'll start seeing that play out. We kind of see it play out a little bit here tonight. And it sets up something big in another return of a different kind for SmackDown Live. Yeah, I mean, I I said it last night uh, on Raw, um, but I have a feeling I know exactly where they're going with this. This is uh, Brock's blood money in the bank. So... We now have an announced SmackDown Live title match as well, so I wouldn't be surprised to see that somehow play a role, too, because you seem to think that he's cashing in on Seth. I think yes. I'm almost certain he's going to cash in on Kofi. I think especially with the announced match um, for the SmackDown, for the uh, WWE title, uh, I have a feeling that it will probably be against Seth because, you know, they're going to want to announce Brock definitely being there ahead of time. And I don't think they'd want to make that into a triple threat. Plus, who else is going to face Seth? Well, that's going to be kind of the question is, are we going to get a Seth Rollins defense here? Because one hasn't been announced yet, but they do have still another, what is it, uh, eight Two. days to get there, nine days or something like that. Uh, June 6th, I want to yeah. say. So a they got like a week and a half. So, yeah. Like, like a week and a half. No, two weeks. Two weeks next and a week half. Is, yeah. Yeah, because next week is uh, Memorial Day. That is and, like they and do next, a, a and, and, and not this upcoming weekend, but the next weekend is TakeOver, and then it's not until... So it'll it'll be two weeks on Friday. Okay, so you may actually be on to something <laughs> with Seth and, and Brock Lesnar for Money in the Bank then, but we'll see what happens. I still think he's cashing in against... Uh, I still think he's cashing in against Kofi. I think that he'll, he may end up facing Seth Rollins and uh, Saudi Arabia. 
but I don't think that he's going to take the title off of Seth in Saudi Arabia. We'll oh, talk no. more about that as it gets closer. You were saying? Um, I think that was all I was going to say was just, um, I think it's going to be Seth, um, especially with how it's, they still have two weeks left to build to this. I have a feeling it'll probably be Brock, um, officially declaring that he's cashing in on Seth next week. And then the final build up the week after. Damn you, Brandon Crawford. Sorry, I got the Braves game on in the background. We're actually recording this on Tuesday night, and the Braves happen to be out on the West Coast right now playing the Giants, and Brandon Crawford just robbed um, Ozzy Albies. Of the <laughs> Stupid Giants. Anyway, let's get to the reason we're actually here now. Let's talk SmackDown, shall we? Let's do it. All right, we open with the New Day, specifically Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods, and they bring out Big E. Oh, wait. No, they don't. It's not Big E. What are you doing here? You're an imposter. Traitor! And then they bring out Big E. Yay! <laughs> Anywho, realistically, though, it doesn't go much of anywhere until Sammy and uh, Kevin Owens come out. New Day says some things that apparently get Kevin Owens in his feelings, and Kevin retreats to the back, but, co- but Sammy promises that it will not be a good night for the New Day members, a sign of things to come. Um, overall, what did you think of our opening segment? Um, it was decent. Nothing too crazy. Um, you know, typical New Day stuff. Uh, you're the resident, uh, you know, know every indie guy on the planet. Do you know who that was? That was the imposter, Biggie? Not a clue. Oh, okay. Um. No, I, I don't follow the Northeast Independent scene like that. Okay, fair enough. Um... But yeah, um, you know, an interesting little bait and switch they they did there. Um, typical bit, typical new new day stuff. Um, apparently, according to what they said, and according to all the timetables that we were reading at, you know, when he first got injured, he's not officially cleared yet. I think this is just kind of another way for WWE to try to pop a rating by bringing. Big E back, even if he's just there basically as a manager uh, for a while. Um, so, yeah, nothing too crazy here, but, you know, it'll be interesting, especially with the wild card rule, if they continue having Sammy and KO kind of aligning themselves together. Well, I mean, the number one contenders to the SmackDown tag team titles are a team from Raw, so. True. Overall, what did you think about uh, the general feeling in regards to the New Day's return here? Uh, I feel like the, the fans were definitely pro New Day here. Oh, definitely. In, in fairness, they weren't in necessarily a smart, heavy city. Providence isn't exactly one of those cities where you think, oh, my God, they're going to be so snarky. They tend to be more laid back, more casual in, in Providence. But, so I, wasn't surprised. I mean, yes, that may help a little bit, but New Day is one of those few teams or one of those few groups, those few wrestlers, that while, yes, there are a few that have been saying since, like, 2016 that the New Day should break up already and whatnot, and there are some, like, ultra smarky fans that don't like them, for the most part, even among smarks, they get a pop. My concern is that like Kofi Kingston said during the course of his promo, he's supposed to be serious now. And if we keep having Kofi involved in these skits with New Day, such as the one that happened tonight here, I worry that that's going to hurt the credibility of Kofi as champion. I don't think so, as long as Kofi is able to do it, is able to, you know, control himself in between the ropes um, and and show that he is a a quality champion within the ropes. Because, I mean, there isn't really any team that I... Or there isn't any, really any wrestler or faction. The closest I could think of, and this is actually kind of an interesting comparison. Yes, he had a darker side to him as well. But later on, you know, 99 forward Mankind was very, uh you know, very playful, very happy-go-lucky. And he was still champion, and he was still a very credible champion. 
agreed to an extent. Um, there was more of a vicious side to Foley when he was the champion at the start in 99, mm. especially in that series of matches with Rock. And yeah. the more jovial mankind that we saw hold the title in August in 99 only held the title for 24 hours. True, true. I'll give you that. But, I mean, I think there's definitely ways you can do it to where they are able to still have fun, still do their New Day stuff, but still be credible champ- a credible threat. I mean, hell, you know, for all these people talking about, oh, you know, uh, Kofi and New Day aren't, you know, serious enough to hold the title and everything, this is the longest reigning tag team champions in WWE history. So don't give me that. Kofi's been able to back it up in the ring so far, exactly. more, or le- more or less. I thought tonight's match against Sammy, and we'll get to that a little in a little bit, was um, disappointing, honestly. I mean, it definitely could have we'll been this, better, uh, but yeah, I mean, we'll talk about it more later. But I think that's more of a symptom of TV versus pay per view matches more than a uh, criticism on Kofi. You might have a point there. All right, let's go ahead and move on here. Hold on. My mother just messaged me on Facebook, so i got to minimize the window there. Uh, backstage, a bunch of the mid-card guys are looking for our truth in order to try to take the 24-7 title. We see Drake Maverick. We see Apollo Crews. There was somebody else that I didn't quite catch in the background. I think it might have been Jinder Mahal. Yeah, it was. I'm uh, Carmella, sure. uh, Carmella eventually finds our truth wearing a wig. A blonde wig at that. Apparently wanting people to think he was Carmella. Make your own joke here. Carmella promises to help Truth escape as long as Truth doesn't do anything too crazy. Well, I mean, by Truth. Do you want to just kind of bubble all these 24-7 segments together? Sure, why not? Just because, I mean, there's really not a whole lot. To the mystery through the show. Yeah, so, especially on this show. show. Um, our second contest of the evening is scheduled for one fall. One fall. And it was Corey Graves' dream match. It was Carmella versus Mandy Rose. <laughs> like, who does Corey cheer for there? I would assume just because of how Mandy is and the fact that he's more of a heel commentator, I would assume Mandy. Well, I would think Mandy, too, but at the same time, you know, internally, he's like, go, Carmella! <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter because about the match, those same mid-card guys that were looking for R-Truth backstage found R-Truth at ringside because he went to ringside with Carmella. Nothing says hiding like being right dead center ringside <laughs> on national television. <laughs> Truth runs... Truth from me giving Carmella a piggyback ride, which I actually thought was kind of funny. Yeah, it was. And then they run through the backstage area where Jinder Mahal, Cordis Axel, and Bo Dallas all get attempts at the title. Eventually, Truth is able to escape and leaves still the way he came in as the WWE European 24-7 champion. Um, follow follow our truth on Facebook if you want to get the European title. And, and follow him just in general. I, I was just going to say, follow him just in general on uh, on Twitter because I have a feeling that, I, or at least I'm certainly hoping, because we were talking about this last night, I'm hoping that this continues throughout the week and maybe we get a few title changes through the week. Well, back to what I talked about last night on the reaction about the DDT Openweight title. It's a 24-7 title, too, mm-hmm. and everyone and everything, including an anime, Your um, what are your, your overall thoughts on the 24-7 title? Um, I mean, I like it for the most part. It definitely brings back memories to the hardcore title and all of that. Um, the one thing that I've seen online people worrying about, and I, I understand where they're coming from, um, is two things. One is that it's already basically becoming, I mean, the, um... It 
it really has already become pretty much a comedy title. Um, and, like, I don't know how long, how much staying power it has. So I don't know how long it'll be able to last. And also, um, and I forgot, I think we did kind of talk about this, um, last night a little bit, but it seems like it's going to be a lower mid to lower card title where anyone above mid card isn't going to give two hoots about it. Because we've seen it twice but now. But I think that works, though. I think that works, though, in order to give some of these lower end card guys something to do. No, I agree with you on that For level. My- I agree with you on that level, but my issue is then if it's just going to be for lower card guys, don't show the higher card guys basically watching and laughing at the chaos. We kind of saw that to an extent with the hardcore title. Towards the Although, end. There yes. were times where the hardcore title would come into play in the main... There were times where the hardcore title would come into play in the main event picture. Mm-hmm. Oh, look at when um, Kurt Angle was feuding with Bob Van Dam over it. Exactly. So, I mean, there's ways to go about this so that you can use it to elevate people as well. Agreed. I'm Agreed. not going to sit here and say that – I'm not going to sit here and say that Titus O'Neil needs elevated because he doesn't. He's mm-hmm. a PR guy for the company at this point, and I think he's perfectly capable and competent of doing that. That being said, though, if you want to use this as a way to bring in somebody from NXT and have them try to make it a more serious title, somebody such as one of the monsters you have down in the NXT developmental system, then that would be something that we could see this title being used for down the road. If you want to see this being used as a way to bring in somebody from the independent scene that's making a big name for themselves, i.e. a certain former Ring of Honor television champion whose contract is expiring soon. Yeah, I can see that being a way for them to bring do that as well. Yeah, I mean, if they do that, then that's great, but you know, I just have this feeling you know, this is WWE we're talking about, I have this feeling that it's just going to be a perpetual lower card comedy belt that, you know, it it's going to run its course sooner rather than later. Well, my hope is that if they decide to keep this as a comedy title, that they keep all the comedy associated with this and let the other performers be a little bit more serious. True. Let that's... the other... Let the let the other performers get their Lance Storm on. True. All right, we go back to the top of the show where we were before we just started discussing this. And our opening contest is scheduled for one fall. One fall. As Ali takes on Andrade with Zelina. Apparently, all three of them have lost at least one name. <laughs> oh, Zelina lost her last name Tom- too now. Uh, I don't know if you saw if you've seen the Chiron in the last couple of days when she came out with Andrade at Money in the Bank and then when she came out with him tonight both times it said Andrade with Selena. Oh wow! There was okay. no Vega. Wow. Well, you know. I mean, I'm not really surprised, but it's still like, damn. Regardless, uh, the match itself goes. Pulling up the time here: eleven minutes and twenty seconds, about eight of which was shown with the commercial break. Ali picks up the win after Andrade takes him lightly following hitting the double knees in the corner to the back of Mustafa Ali's head. Oh, wait, to the back of Ali, not Mustafa Ali's head. He's still Mustafa Ali to me, Dana. Oh, yes. He's been Prince Mustafa Ali since the independence. He's Mustafa Ali to me, Dana. Anyway. Hey, I, 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 still some, Ali picks- I, I still sometimes find myself uh, calling Big E, Big E Langston. Yeah, it's just old habits to hard. Yeah. In this instance, though, Ali picks up the win after that cradle there. My question to you is, is this, this win that he picked up tonight hurt Andrade? Because Andrade dominated 85 to 90% of the match, only for Ali to pick up the fluke victory cradle after the lackadaisical cover following the corner double knees. Um, not too much, because, you know, you can make two arguments for why this happened. One is that Andrade took Mustafa too lightly, um, and also that his mind is on other things, like focusing on Finn Balor. Um, I think that's a mistake, though, having Andrade lose this match going into his battle with the Demon King. Oh, I agree in that sense, but you can 
there are ways that you can, uh, you know, work around it to where it doesn't hurt him as much. Fair enough. I mean, we'll see more from, we'll see more sooner rather than later from Andrade, especially he as he gets closer and closer to that showdown with <laughs> Fowler, a la in or uh, what was what was it that we used yesterday? Um, Sweet Saudi Money Three, I think we called it. I, I called it Blood Money Three. I believe I used the term Sweet Saudi yes. Money Three. Yes, you did. I, I I will say I do stand by Larry's use of Allah in. Made me laugh hilariously the first time I saw it. Like legit, put the phone down from laughing. Laugh. <laughs> it's good. What can it I say? Is. Speaking of which, shout out to shout out to Larry Zonka, four hundred one Mania, whose SmackDown Live review I'm using as the format for tonight's show. All right, A video package for Lars Sullivan airs here right before the previously mentioned Mandy Rose Carmella match. Sullivan apparently is feuding with the Lucha House Party on Raw, therefore why they're showing this video package on SmackDown is confusing as all hell to me. Because rules don't matter anymore. This is well, WWE. Split... What? Were you about to do a Who's Line Is It Anyway? Yes, joke? I was. Yes, I was. Go ahead, because well, I was going to as well. Welcome to WWE, where the rules don't... Or, damn it. Where... You you do it. You He's probably lost. have a better one than I do. He lost it. And moments passed. For those who follow the Who's Line Is It Anyway meme, though, they'll get the reference. Oh, yes. Welcome to WWE, where the wild cards are made up and the brands don't matter. <laughs> That's a good one. There you go. Happy? All right, let's move on. Bailey talks about winning the Money in the Bank match and the SmackDown Women's title in the same night, which would have a little bit more zest behind it if Alexa Bliss hadn't done the exact same thing last year. Although, in fairness, Alexa actually came in and interrupted the match where she cashed in on the champion. Charlotte actually beat Becky before Charlotte before Bailey beat Charlotte. She says she has moved past the hug and wants the best that the SmackDown Live women division has to offer. Well, unfortunately for her, most of the best wrestlers in the company are on Raw. Yep. Although, you know who I wouldn't be mind seeing more of, especially if they decide to let her get serious again? Who? Yeah. Give me Bailey and Mickey James all day, every day. Ooh, Bailey and Ember Moon. Bailey and Ember Moon, I'd definitely like to see. That would be an interesting uh, match. Um, another one that I'd way my I would love to see. Granted, um, she's kind of held up with the tag title scene at the moment, but give you us an Bailey and Oscar. Yep, have a, an NXT rematch of Bailey and Oscar. I was just gonna say that running back Bailey and Oscar from their days in NXT wouldn't be the worst idea for the SmackDown Live Women's Division either. Yep, but Oscar and Kyrie Sane are too busy caught up with the Iconics. None of those four actually appeared on tonight's show, but if you like video packages, boy, do I have great news for you. <coughs> Elias is outside playing his guitar. Big E has been attacked backstage by Kevin Owens, allegedly. You can know. never know nowadays. I feel like this could be the planting of the seeds for Big E. Oh, God, don't, no, don't say that. Uh, I think you you groan, but I'm not kidding. I I, no, I'm I'm not denying that it's not probably the case, but oh god, don't. For, first yeah. off, first off, the new day with how much they've done and everything, it it just works. Like this is a team that I don't think should ever break up. But outside of that. Don't rehash a storyline that you've done a couple of years ago with the with two persona non gratos. How you doing? Exactly. My name is no, no, can't say that. We'll get sued. I'm also being told that I'm not allowed to say balls Mahoney. <laughs> Don't say balls Mahoney. 
We need we we need a uh, Bray to get back. So uh, wait, no, that's Joe. Never mind. Um, we didn't get a Joe match. Last, well, we technically did, but he didn't use uh, our favorite move. <laughs> technically, he's been known to use that move too. True. 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 So, so there are multiple ways to get around the Uranagi. No Uranagi. <laughs> So funny. All right. Hit it. Our next contest is scheduled for a fall. One fall. We're working the hits, people. <laughs> Kofi Kingston takes on Sami Zayn in a non-title match. And you want to know why nobody buys Sami as a credible threat? Because he never freaking wins. <laughs> yep. This is uh, the Bray Wyatt syndrome all over again. Eight minutes and 15 seconds, about six of which was shown. Kofi Kingston cleanly hits Trouble in Paradise after escaping the, what was it that Sammy went for? The Blue Thunder Bomb. Yep. And clean as day, right in the center, Kofi takes Trouble in, or hits Trouble in Paradise for the pinfall. The match itself was okay. The post-match is what we'll talk about, though, I mm. think. Oh, Definitely. Paul Heyman comes onto the stage holding up the briefcase, and you're thinking, oh, shit, SmackDown, what, what, huh? And then Paul Heyman is just a distraction for Dolph Ziggler. Wait, he still has a job. Apparently. Yep. To come out through the crowd and attack Kofi Kingston and lay in a pretty solid little beat down on Kofi Kingston. Eventually, the EMTs and the referees break it up. Ziggler makes himself scarce. They put Kofi on a stretcher and try to get him up the ramp, but Kofi apparently channeled his inner Mick Foley. He was talking to Foley about this backstage on Raw, and was like, I'm not going out on the stretcher, man, and eventually makes his way to the back on his own. Uh, we can kind of talk about the match. I mean, we, we pretty much already did in regards to the fact that Sammy doesn't have a whole lot of credibility, so the result here wasn't really in doubt, but... Let's talk about the return here. Did you see Dolph Ziggler coming? And if you did, you're a damn liar. No, no, I did not see Dolph Ziggler coming at all. Um, <coughs> it was pretty cool seeing uh, them use one one of my favorite uh, extreme rule or extreme uh, moves that we haven't seen in a while. Well, granted, we've been seeing him more often lately. It's surprising, honestly. Um, but the, the chair and head spot. Uh, I was a little surprised he went to the announce table with it instead of the ring post, but it worked. Mm-hmm. But then we actually saw him, like, do the, the, the stomp on it as well. Which I feel would be a little bit easier to protect than the uh, announce table would be. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. So that's probably the safer of the moves, but regardless... What are your thoughts on Kofi not staying on the stretcher? Do you like it? Does it does it make you think of him as more of a fighter? Or yeah, do you think oh, that... oh, definitely. This is a way, that's one of the many ways that you can show that he is a legitimate threat, that, you know, he's not going to, you know, sit down to anyone, all of that. Um, you know, there there's a lot of ways you can you can make Kofi look good, and this is definitely one of them. You almost said strong. I know you did. Yes. Speaking of looking strong, Roman arrives late. That's a fine. And Elias greets him with a song. That's an embarrassment. How did he get up there? I have... I'm I'm assuming there's like a ladder on the... um, On the... uh, On the... On the trailer. Maybe they had one of those extra ladders that didn't get broken at Money in the Bank on them. Yep. But it would have had to have been one of them tall bitches, too, though, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Because that trailer was up there. I mean, we've seen it before where there's a random ladder, you know, attached to one of the trailers. Backstage, Bailey and Becky talk about their forthcoming match, and Bailey kind of teases going after Becky's Raw Women's title. I don't actually see that happening. So Bailey Two Belts has a ring to it as well. It does. Regardless, our next contest, it's the Teddy Long special. It's a tag match. Player. Scheduled for one fall. 
as Bailey and Becky team up to take on Charlotte and Lacey Evans or Two Dumb Blondes, <laughs> as, the, as the song used to go. In the end, Bailey picks up the victory, countering Charlotte's attempt at a figure eight into a roll up after tagging herself in when Becky got hit with the women's right by Lacey Evans. I kind of like that that they had uh, that they didn't use this as an opportunity to set up Bailey's first challenger, and they let Bailey have a moment in the sun to enjoy her championship parade because this is the first time in probably almost two or three years that Bailey has been champion, and she gets a moment to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it was a it was a good moment. Um... They seem to be doing that more often, where they don't jump right into the next feud right away and give, especially the the face champions, a, a week or two in the sun with their titles. I mean, they did with Kofi, uh, they did with Seth, you know, they did with well, Becky for the most part. There's also the obvious fact that they don't have to build to a women's title match at Super Showdown. True, very true. They have which a few extra didn't, weeks. Which, in case you didn't know, is going to be equal to or exceed WrestleMania. Oh, God. They're just going to bury all of their uh, their big four, aren't they? Well, we've already had the greatest Royal yep. Rumble. Now we have... We're getting the equal to or equivalent, exceed WrestleMania. I called this on Raw, and you can attest that I called this on Raw. Later this year, we're going to get the greatest Survivor Series, and it's going to be like Raw versus SmackDown, everybody from both brands against each other. They're going to need three rings, 6,000 people at ringside, and like seven referees. Just do the so World War Three. Just, just basically do the World War Three format of three rings. And... You know, that is a match that I think the WWE could bring back and actually make work. I think it's just. I, I mean, mean, I mean, we complain enough about able to see shit. Still, what? People wouldn't be able to see shit. But exactly. Still, I think it could work. That's the only, that. That's the reason why I say it could never work because you could hardly see enough as is with the Andre. Do you really think that anyone's going to be able to follow anything with three rings twenty? 20 men apiece. Man, the only thing I remember from this year's Andre was Braun almost killing Luke Harper and Ali. Exactly. Oh, and those <sighs> SNL I remember them too. Yep. Co- uh, Sarah, what is her last name? Schreiber, I think they said? I think you're right. Sounds right. She's about to have an interview with Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler says that you're not getting the scoop. I'm going to go out and talk to everybody. Ziggler comes out, and I know I'm going to get flamed for this. I don't care. Cuts one of the best promos of his career. Everything that Dolph Ziggler said made perfect sense there because it completely and entirely fit in with the show-off character, in my opinion. Oh, definitely. And begging pleading for opportunities to get the chance to shine. When Ali went down, instead of giving Ziggler the chance to shine, that opportunity went to Kofi, and Kofi made the most of it. And Dolph feels like if they'd have given that opportunity to Dolph, Dolph would have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. As as Dolph put it himself, it should have been me. It definitely fits with his character that he's had over the last couple of years. Um, And, you know... He's right in a way because you know I think if if he were given that golden opportunity, um, first off I think a lot more people would have expected him to run with it much more than like Kofi was kind of a shock to everyone, um, but Dolph I mean we've seen it in the past we've seen it before when the company's guy behind him the pops that he's gotten I mean you can't forget his cash in uh in 2012 uh 13 no 2013 rather um so the only re- the only reason I know that is cuz I was just recently watching that episode of raw ah okay um but yeah you know he's he's not wrong and I agree with you this was one of his better promos that you know he's put on um, you know, he spoke with real emotion and all of that, so 
Like, you could tell that Dolph genuinely felt what he was saying there. It is the most real Dolph Ziggler has ever come off as Dolph Ziggler. Mm hmm. I mean, I doubt it'll do anything, but, you know, maybe we do end up getting a Dolph run out of it. Well, not to mention, we've also seen Dolph and Kofi have tremendous chemistry in their matches before, too, Mm. over the Intercontinental West title. So I'm all for them using this as an opportunity to either give Kofi another marquee victory or to give Dolph a time in the the sun. Yep. Easy for me to say. So do you remember how I said if you love video packages, this show was for you? Yes. We get in five minutes. They spent almost five minutes on a Triple H Randy Orton video package. I mean, while while some people are going to hate pretty much anything that we get, if they continue this throughout the next couple of weeks, in a way, it's actually kind of good. Because instead of using up probably 15, 20 minutes on an in-ring promo and probably still getting these video packages to boot, it kind of, it builds up to the feuds and the matches that we're getting in Saudi Arabia um, be, again, between the legends um, while not while not using up a lot of time that could be used for younger guys, for the current crop. Okay, that's fair to an extent. And the reason I say that is is because if you don't think we're going to get an in-ring promo from either Orton or Triple H in the next two weeks, you're crazy. Oh, we probably will, but what I'm saying is we only have two weeks left before the show, and we still have not seen... Triple H, Randy Orton, Goldberg, Undertaker, at all, in the ring. And unless they're going to cram all four of those guys into the last week and pretty much use up half the episode for that, then they're, they're building the feuds while not using up too much time on the air. So what you're saying is is you're okay with them using the video packages as long as we don't get the long winning promos to accompany it. Exactly. I know that I was able to mute the TV and get a snack when this video package was on, so it worked out pretty well for me. Exactly. You know, and the video packages, it's something that you can use as like a snack break, a bathroom break, what have you, because it's things that most fans who have been watching the product for years already know. So, I feel like these video packages for these feuds are more so for the newer, more casual fans, basically telling them this is why these guys have a history and why they're facing off in Saudi Arabia. Um, okay, I can I can understand that. That makes sense to me. And, and while at the same time not pissing off people by, you know, wasting 15, 20 minutes of the show with them doing a long-winded promo. So, you know how I said Sami Zayn can't buy a win? Uh-huh. Your main event scheduled for one fall. One fall. Is a return match for Money in the Bank where Roman Reigns takes on Elias. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Spear, pinfall, 8 minutes, 40 seconds. LOL, Roman wins. Jesus. <laughs> he really is the new Cena when it comes to this I, kind of... I mean, I warned them about it back in March. I'll say it again, and the the... The, the sand is dropping even quicker now, I feel. If you continue this way, there's probably still that little bit of good faith and, you know, kind of reservation Empathy. about booing him because of what he went through still. If you don't... Empathy. What? Yes, empathy. There we go. 
if you do not stop this maelstrom of him just constantly winning and basically putting him back right into the spot that he was before, that good faith and empathy is going to vanish like that. And I'm not even going to say by SummerSlam. By extreme rules, we are going to get majority boos. I said back when we did our prediction special here on the W2M Network, and I said it when I did my predictions with the guys over on the Raw Reaction every Monday night at 11.30 p.m. on the Chairshot Radio Network. Make sure you guys check it out. Show! Anywho. Especially check, this, especially check this week's out, since I'm on it. That Roman Reigns should have lost to Drew McIntyre mm-hmm. at WrestleMania. Agreed. Because of the story that you could tell of Roman struggling to come back and get back into the day-to-day life of being a WWE superstar is so much better than Roman struggling to face the McMahons once again because Austin versus Vince worked out so well in 1998. Yeah, having the, the story of having Roman coming back and losing and then him trying to think, like, do I still have it? And having to build himself back up. Um, and, I mean, not just on a mental level, which that would be the key storyline, though. But I don't know if many other people noticed it. I noticed it a little bit. But Tori definitely mentioned it to me when he first came back to announce that he was in remission and everything and that he was back. She said, does he look smaller? And I think it did take a little bit off of him in terms of uh, his muscle mass. And both on a physical and a mental level, you could have had such a deep story of him, you know, having to go within himself of saying, do I still have this? You know, did this take too much out of me and having to build himself back? And you could have had a whole storyline of him constantly losing or having to, you know, just squeak by a win up until sur- un- up until SummerSlam, where he finally gets his big win, and then you could go back to him being, you know, dominant, but you know, do it in a way where it's not going to automatically get booze. Well, not to mention there's a level of vulnerability that will have been built up by that time to the point that when he's finally able to overcome the odds, people would be more likely to support him. Exactly. Exactly. God forbid we tell a detailed story sometimes, you know? Really? I feel like I ask this question every single week. Where does Elias go from here? The answer, and forgive my language, is fucking nowhere. Yep, pretty much. He's there to get cheap heat because of his music and nothing more. I mean, he basically just is... He's basically what they wanted... Bray Wyatt to be, but the problem is that Wyatt needed wins in order to keep his gimmick up. Elias does not. So Elias is just going to be there basically as cannon fodder that still gets the heat, gets the pop because of what he does outside of the ring. Post-match, Shane jumps in to attack Roman because we have to build the sweet Saudi money three. Roman starts to get the advantage. And then Drew Drew McIntyre claymores the absolute bejesus out of Roman Reigns. That claymore looked awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. In fairness, I have a bit of a bias. McIntyre is one of my favorites. Yes. But still... That Claymore looked awesome. Oh, yeah. <sighs> like, I, I actually prefer the fact that it's against Shane at a, a Super Showdown. And the reason being is that they're not sacrificing McIntyre again. True. True. Although what's probably going to end up happening is McIntyre and Miz are going to end up getting added to this match, and it'll be a Teddy Long special. Tag Play. match. Player. Mhm. Yeah, I I could probably see that. 
Um, Either way, that brings us to an end for this episode of SmackDown, May 21st, 2019. Scale of 1 to 10, Brandon, where do you fall? Um... I'll give it a six. This episode, there were some moments, you know, seeing Sasha and Bailey with their titles, all of that, that was good. Um, there were, you know, the the whole Kofi stuff, it, it built to something. We'll have to see where that goes with Dolph. You know, seeing Dolph and his viciousness, that was pretty cool. But outside of that, nothing really too spectacular happened here. Um... You know, surprisingly, we didn't get a title change with the 24-7 title. We'll see where that goes uh, moving forward. Like I said, hopefully we get some outside of WWE TV stuff that'll draw people to watch the, the YouTube channel, put some stuff on the network. I mentioned last night that apparently NXT has, like, this... NXT Combine that they're doing uh, on Saturday throughout the day. You could do stuff with that where Truth is there and someone pins him and it go, you know it's a whole running thing throughout the event uh, to get people to tune in. Um, but outside of that, nothing really spectacular happened here. I'm just slightly higher than you at a six and a half. And the reason being is, as you know, I prefer my stories to be told in the ring. And they kept the talking to a minimum on tonight's show. Mm-hmm. Outside of the video package, which, as I said, I more or less ignored. The only two in-ring talking segments that we really got were the New Day to open the show and Dolph Ziggler's promo coming towards the end of it. And both of those told stories that needed to be told. The return of Big E for the New Day and then Dolph's reasoning behind why he attacked Kofi the way that he did. True. One word review, Brandon. What do you got? Mm, I'm going to say lackluster because especially after last night and, you know, kind of seeing the potential of things to come, uh, tonight just kind of fell flat to me. Uh, you know, like the, like you said, there were some good moments. There were some fun moments. But outside of that, nothing to, you know, Nothing too crazy really happened here. Development. Big E's return, storyline development there with potentially a run with Big E and Kevin Owens, which, for the record, if they want to run Big E versus Kevin Owens as a feud, I'm all for that because those two would have some awesome matches. Oh, yeah, that would be a fun match. Dolph Ziggler makes his return to the WWE for an opportunity to once again go back over to Saudi Arabia, similar to the performance that he had over there last year during the Best in the World tournament. Um, And the biggest one to me is kind of laying the groundwork for Becky and Bailey potentially down the road, which I think would be fun to deal with too. Mm -hmm. So there were things that were done that could be interesting that going forward, depending on what they decide to do with them. That's the question though, is how will they follow up? Exactly. Uh, th- this can... week, this week in WWE, it leaves a lot of questions to be answered, which is good, um, because uh, you know that's the way you get viewers to stick around. But at the same time, this is WWE. You know, it may w- very well fall flat on its face. One thing that I just thought of that I, I want to mention real quick. And I really hope that this isn't a case of them dropping something because they have too much on their plate before it even really... I mean, it has built steam, but before it really even gets off the ground. But we didn't even get them re-showing the even small version of Firefly Funhouse that we got last night. I think they had too many other things that they needed to cram into the show tonight with the uh, segment with our truth and then the video package that they had put aside for Orton and Triple H. But that could also be that could also be a sign that Bray's heading to Raw when he returns too. That is true. We'll we'll have to wait and see what happens next week. 
But to touch on the, the thing that you said right there, then we'll uh, go ahead and wrap this up here. Um, that would mean that another word to describe tonight's episode of SmackDown was episodic. Mm -hmm. It answered a few questions, but it raised a couple more. True. And I think that you want that in your weekly television shows if you're a wrestling fan because it gives you reason to tune in to the following. Oh, oh definitely. Definitely. So credit where it's due for to the members of creative and however they managed to put together the two shows this week. I thought both shows this week were actually pretty strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, compared to some of the stuff that we've had recently. Oh, definitely. As compared to what we've gotten over the last few weeks, this was definitely a much better uh, showing. Um, makes you want to tune in and makes you curious about what's going to happen moving forward. Um, but they haven't quite shown enough to where it's like they're not they're not completely out of the woods yet. I think that wraps it up for us, Brandon. Yep. As we've pointed out several times, Brandon is the special guest co-host this week on the Raw Reaction over on the Chairshot Radio Network. If you want mine and Brandon's thoughts on Monday Night Raw, I encourage you guys to go visit blogtalkradio.com backslash the Chairshot and look for the May 20th edition of the Raw Reaction for the review of the post-Money in the Bank episode of Monday Night Raw. Cedric Cologne will probably be back in this chair next week, we assume, for the Raw review. Yep. I should be here for the money in the for the SmackDown Live review. I almost said money in the bank review. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we can all get together and do something for NXT Takeover Twenty Five. Yep. Support independent wrestling. Yes. If you're one of those fans that has grown tired of the stagnated WWE product, some of us get more enjoyment out of others. Some of us, and that's perfectly fine. Different levels for different people. AEW's Double or Nothing is this weekend. If you have the financial means to do so, check out the show. If you don't have the financial means to do so, get together with some friends. See about working together and having like a watch party. Everybody chips in five or ten bucks to order the show. I used to do that all the time with the pay-per-views with my buddies when they were like 50 or 60 bucks each. It's an easy way to watch a show and not to mention to prove in fact that you have more fun watching the show with other people than you do by yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh just because of the interaction levels that you can have and the amount of intellectual stimulation that you can get from watching with multiple people. Yep. Brandon, where else can people find you? Uh, they can find me on the Raw Review most weeks, uh, this week on the Raw Reaction, um, and they can find me on the kickoff once, uh, once the NFL season starts. Technically closer to when college football season starts because well, true. We, we definitely have to get our college football review out because week one, not even week one, week zero, the week before the official kickoff of the college football season, Miami versus Florida. Oh, God, Eric. that's that's going to be a fun show. Eric versus Harry. Oh, lovely. You and Jason basically get to play peacekeepers. Oh, lovely. Do do <laughs> any of team? our um, NFL teams face off this year? Um, Actually, I believe Buffalo plays the, AFC, the NFC East this year. Oh, to be fun. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, my Bills and Sean's Cowboys play on Thanksgiving Day. Ooh. And if I'm not mistaken, we actually kick off the regular season against each other. It's either week one or week two. I in think New York you're right. Like yeah. At at uh, Giant Stadium. It's either week one or week two, because I know the first two weeks of the state of the season, Buffalo's at Giant Stadium to play the Jets and the Giants back to back. Yep. And then we have a home game week three, which means we won't even leave the state of New York for the first month of the season. <laughs> That's funny. That could work out pretty well for us. We'll see what happens. He's yep. Brandon Biscuit. I'm Harry Broadhurst. This has been the Wrestling to the Max SmackDown Live Review for May 21st, 2019 here on the W2M Network, online at W2Mnet.com, your home for everything you need in the world of sports, entertainment, video games, wrestling, and so much more. That is over at W2Mnet.com. In addition, you can listen to the W2M Network family of podcasts by checking us out on Stitcher, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Podbean, CastBox, 
Hey, Brandon, guess what? Spotify is here. And Chris Anderson can suck it. Let's go, Braves. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you guys next week here on the SmackDown Live Review on the WQM Network.